Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Premier Pundits podcast. Of course, it's Monday, and I'm joined by the fantasy doc, Raj Brad from 3CB Performance. How are you, my friend? It's been a while. Yeah, long, <laughs> long time. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Yeah, full of busy, Raj, full of busy. Oh, of course, we mm. see you twice last week. And, well, it's great to speak to you about, you know, it, you would know it's never good news on the injury front when we'll have to bring you in more than once. And this weekend, again, didn't disappoint in terms of the number of reported incidents we've seen throughout the Premier League. And I've got three major talking points from game week 24. One of those being uh, with regards to Ben May the Burnley mm-hmm. centre-back who picked up what looked to be initially quite a nasty head injury. Now, it was a game I was watching and I watched the footage and to me, it looked as if the player momentarily lost consciousness, went down, medical team, great, you know, they were on, it was a stretcher, the neck brace, and he was whisked away. Um, and it was something I never really give much thought to in, in terms of would he be available to play in the midweek fixture against Fulham, you know, understanding the protocol and the guidelines associated with, you know, return to play for, for players who've lost consciousness. Um, I was quite surprised to see me, me timeline light up, as it were. Um, you know, is Ben Me going to play? I've heard he is. I've had it on good authority. I'm a, I'm a in the note account. And I was just like, I don't think that's the case. And, and for me, I'm not sure if people are um, reading in a little bit too much into to Sean Dyche's post-match comments, when of course um, Ben Mee was, you know, at, at the forefront of those questions, and and when asked how was he, went, he's fine, he's no problem, he's, he's walking around the change room, he's having a conversation, and there are no issues there, and those sentiments were echoed by Sean Dyche on Monday's press conference ahead of the Fulham game. However, what he said was, you know, there's a in terms of an enhanced care setting which elite footballers are part of, the quickest a player can return to play due to protocol is six days. And, and I suppose my question to you, Raj, is they have the protocols in place to protect players who've suffered you know, concussions or suspected concussions and serious mm-hmm. head trauma and impact. And I mean, could you go into a little bit of detail as to why those protocols are in place and and maybe why it is so dangerous to to maybe you know ignore those signs and and maybe um, you know if the protocol wasn't there to involve players you know matches in quick succession when they've had that kind of head trauma. Yeah, sure. I think, I think the first thing to understand here is that if he's in the protocol then the medical team very likely thinks, or they suspect that he had, he did in fact have a concussion. And so what we know about concussions is that symptoms aren't, oh, they don't always follow the same time course. It's not something where that immediately you have these symptoms. It could be something where he's not having them immediately, but then they pop up later on. That's why you have that six day time period. That's the typical time where you will see alleviation of those symptoms. And then the other aspect is if you don't have that in place, there is something called you know, second impact syndrome, which there is some research showing behind it, where if you have a second concussion within a certain time period within the first, it can lead to significantly more dangerous impact. So of course they have to guard against that as well. I mean, it's only the brain in the end, right? It's only the no, most important aspect. Yeah. No big deal, right? <laughs> and so you have to be cautious here. Yeah, of course, always looked at it on the side of caution. I mean, good news is, thankfully, um, it, it didn't appear to be too serious. And the expectation is, given that Burnley don't play again, I think it's on the, the Saturday, or, or you know, he will be available to play uh, in game week 25, should he come through that, you know, that that phased, uh, graded return to play protocol. So that's good news on that one. Secondly, now we're recording at uh, what would be 5 p.m. Um, British British time on Monday. So mm-hmm. we've just had the team news um, ahead of the West Ham and Sheffield United game at the London Stadium. The big talking point heading into this game was the fitness of Mikel Antonio. Now, as we know, you know, West Ham flying along, Mikel Antonio has been pivotal. Um, to that West Ham lineup, David Moyes is a huge fan, um, you know. And following the fact that Sebastian Haller was sold during the January transfer window, it's left 
West Ham a little bit lightweight in the front. No, you know, backup secondary senior striker in place. So pictures released by the club over the weekend that showed Mikel Antonio on the train and pitches for a lot of FPL managers and a lot of those who brought him into the team. You know, that was great news. You know, the, the, there was a, an expectation within the community that Mikel Antonio would be in that starting eleven, or indeed the match day squad tonight. Now that hasn't, you know, that hasn't materialised. He's basically been omitted from the squad, and again, it looks as if David Moyes is looking to protect the player. But again, I just want to ask the, the question to you is, and, and to maybe help people understand is why we might see a player on the training pitches and working and and look as if he's doing all of those activities, but yet he's omitted from the match day squad and, and seemingly not fit enough. Sure. So, in, I mean, coming back to the pitch is part of that return to play progression, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how far they still are from that. Because not only do they have to do that return to play on the pitch, but then they have to assess how we feel during and after it. And we're not privy to that information, of course. And unless, let's say, the manager tells us how he's been feeling, even that often, like we find out, has to do with a grain of salt. And so all we're seeing in these pictures is a very small slice of the overall pie. And it doesn't really give us that much detailed information as to whether he'll be included, of course, in on match day. And in this case, clearly they're not comfortable with him being included or it was never really even in his original timeline for them for him to be included. But obviously, uh, looking at the fact that he is training again outside, he's progressed from the gym, then that would suggest he is moving in the right direction and possibly mm -hmm. maybe looking ahead to game week 25. He's a player that maybe is worth some kind of consideration. Yeah, I think definitely possibly. The one caution here, I know as we always talk about, with a player like him who has extensive hamstring injury risk or a, a history of hamstring injuries and therefore more risk, you might have to be even more cautious with him in that regard and also his playing style tends to also may contribute to that as well so again those are all factors the team has to take in, to, into consideration and like you said yes they are lightweight up front but it's also something if we bring him back too early and then he gets injured again now you're extremely lightweight for the rest of the season potentially so it's that risk reward tightrope yeah, yeah. So maybe, you know, rest him for a game to potentially save him from a maybe a, a four or six week layoff. Um, exactly. I mean, what I would like to uh, I'll simply add to that as well, just because we've seen Antonio on the training pitches, again, a return to train is not a return to play. We flip that mm -hmm. over and a lot of questions we always get asked is, where is such and such on the training pitches? I haven't seen him from the, you know, the, the cameraman hasn't. You know, just because somebody isn't there, again, it doesn't mean that that player isn't going to be involved ahead of a, a specific game. Um, and it would never be a, a, a you know a Monday <laughs> roundup, Raj, if we didn't touch upon upon Liverpool. Right. Um, I mean, we could probably create our own show around Liverpool at this moment in time. But yeah, what I want to do is maybe address the elephant in the room with regards to the number of injuries that they've had in in this common misconception that this high number of, of injuries is is merely down to the fact that you know in a, a quote unquote social media that question the medical team are crap the physios must be rubbish you know what are they actually doing get them sacked all of this blame is apportioned to that medical team when you know the reality of the situation is they have very little to do with the management of players maybe on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis when they're, when they're fully fit. No, it's very true. I mean, there's there's so many different people who are managing players, whether it comes to you know, the sports science staff, coaching staff, or looking at uh, understanding that load aspect, whereas the physio-mental team really comes in more into play when there is an overt issue or something that's an overt risk. And even in Liverpool in general, if you look at their – health and fitness level prior to this season, considering the amount of minutes and games they've played, it was actually quite, quite good. So I can't suddenly say anyone has suddenly turned a crap, quote unquote, 
based off one season, right? It's not like a switch gets hit and suddenly you're terrible. And so you have to look at the overall trend line. And, you know, this year we know this is a team that's played a lot in recent years, high intensity tournaments and matches. Now you have a quick turnaround time. And to an extent, I mean, you have Klopp playing some of his guys heavy, heavy minutes when maybe there should be a bigger rotation there, right? So there's so many variables there as to why the injuries are going on. And some of the injuries are frankly just bad luck. How can you account for Jordan Pickford smashed into BBD's leg? You can't, anyone's going to get injured there, right? Tiago getting hit on the knee due to a rash challenge. Those contact injuries happen. Yeah, and, and look, exactly what you said, you know, the, the, the data collected um, in the build-up prior to this season has always, you know, the, Liverpool inherently have a great injury record. And we, you know, we mustn't forget as well, it comes down to, to player history as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we often see there's a lot of questions levied at, at Joel Matip. And his, and his ability to be able to tolerate the demands of the game. And, um, you know, if you're having a player who is maybe has 50, 60 percent availability, again, you can't flick a switch and then all of a sudden he's not going to have an 80 to 95 percent availability when his career has done nothing to suggest that. So, you know, you factor that in and, the, you know, and then your Gomez is out and your Van Dyke's out and then additional strains on the squad and maybe... Henderson could have been rested had players been available on other occasions. But again, going back to your point, it's, it's risk and reward. And sometimes, you know, the squad just isn't able to, or, or Jurgen Klopp isn't able to maybe switch things around and rotate maybe, um, you know, as much as he would have liked. No, absolutely. And then I think to your point about Henderson or even Fabinho, for example, you now have players who are playing in different positions which then puts different demands on them. And you might not be, have been training for the last six or seven months to be in that position, right? If you're a center back now, there might be more contact. There might be more leverage you have to play with, which then puts more stress on your body that you're not acclimated to yet. So those are all new variables that the team is dealing with due to this strain, this domino effect of injuries. Yeah, great, great point, Raj. Big and hot on the fantasy manager's lips is the fitness of Ilga Gundogan. Now, of course, those who were watching Saturday's game saw the German uh, touch the inside of his, or the top of his, his right thigh. It looked to be uh, an issue with his groin. Now, Pep's come out and said that, um, you know, the German international had been very intelligent. He felt something and he went down and would replace them, um, you know, before any series has happened. However, what we do know is, you know, Sean Dyche, we take what managers say with a pinch of salt. So to give us maybe a little bit of further insight into what potentially could have happened with Gundogan and also ahead of the game with Everton and whether he, he may or may not be fit for that game, the fantasy doc, Raj. So it really comes down to based on where he was touching out, like you said, the inside of that thigh. I immediately thought it was what we call one of the adductor muscles, which is quite commonly injured with, during football. And so if it's that case, it really just comes down if what Pep is saying is true, whether he caught it early or if there's an overt strain. Even if there is a grade one, typically that can take you know, a week to 10 days to heal, especially for a player who's that important to the club's side. So he, he may... He may miss out. I would almost bank on him missing out because if it's, it's such a sensitive injury area, it could also be the hip flexor. But again, both sensitive areas that have notorious injury risk. But of course, we'll know more following the update. Yeah, I mean, we have a, a press conference scheduled for uh, Tuesday ahead of the game. Um, you know, I mirror your thoughts, so I echo those. Uh, in my opinion, I think Gundogan uh, will be rested. He will miss out. Regardless, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the form that he's been in, he's, he's been such a pivotal player in the absence of, of Kevin De Bruyne. Um, his status within the team, uh, you, you know, it's, it can be questioned. But, you know, City inherently have a decent, you know, a, 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 quite a fit and healthy squad at this moment in time. And there are mm-hmm. other options. So Pep does have other players at his disposal that he could bring in. I think even Phil Foden playing a little bit deeper, um, you know, into mm-hmm. that that midfield three is an option as well so yeah definitely I think um, 
you know, we'd be lucky to see Gundogan in that starting eleven on Wednesday. Listen, as always, it's been fantastic. I have a feeling, you know, we may have a second. We could even have a third, a third Maybe. get together. We, we've got Premier League games. We've got um, Europa um, League and UEFA Champions League action um, back this week. So the games are coming thick and fast once again. But as always, it's been an absolute pleasure, Raj. I thank you once again. Um, yeah, check out Raj at 3CB Performance on his YouTube channel, on social media. If you're not following him, why not? You're missing a treat. But for now, that's all. Thanks, everyone.